Backyard Green Films is proud to present this episode of Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Alara and her husband, Rick, travel throughout the land in their teardrop trailer that they have nicknamed Maggie, bringing you stories about their travels and the people they meet. They visit farmers, ranchers, and just about anyone who loves putting their hands in the dirt or their feet in stirrups. In those travels, they have gotten to meet some very interesting people. Here's one of those interviews. Hi, this is Alara. Welcome back to our podcast. On this week's podcast, we're continuing last week's food adventure from Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'll again mention that, to my great gastronomic sorrow, I was only able to go on the New Mexico adventure for a day or two, and Rick had to do the rest of the interviews on his own. If there is one set of conversations you really don't want to miss, it's when some phenomenal farm-to-table restaurateurs get together to do interesting and yummy things with fresh and wholesome food. Cherie Montoya is the owner of the Farm and Table Restaurant. Well, we say restaurant, but she's involved in what's really more of a holistic concept relating to food, community, health, an appreciation for the land, and paying it forward. Cherie is a local born and bred and gained an appreciation for fresh and delicious homegrown and regional foods in her grandma's kitchen, where she learned to make empanadas and tamales. Her grandparents had a garden and an orchard, so she learned the love of fresh food and its importance in family and community meals at the cradle. Her father has continued the tradition with a preservation mindset in regenerative farming and an appreciation for the land culture, and heritage of the Rio Grande Valley. So let me just stop here for a minute for a quick note. I can personally relate to how growing up with this whole family backyard garden thing might change your taste buds and change your perspective on store-bought produce. My dad's propensity to plant, plant, and plant resulted in his sending his girls out to pick, pick, and pick, which led to my mom's necessity to can, can, and can. Ed Disler was a big believer in, if a little bit is good, a whole lot is better. It works well with many things, but definitely not green beans or zucchini. You get to a moment where you never want to see another green thing in your life, even if it was one of your favorite vegetables. But as tired as you might get of picking veggies when you're a teenager, it also allows you one of those almost indescribably rich moments in life. Where you stop bending over a row in the garden for a few minutes because it's so hot, you walk over to the Santa Rosa plum tree and grab a piece of fruit so ripe that the purple is almost black. You stand in the bright sun, you bite into the fruit, and the juice drips down your chin. Sweet, melt-in-your-mouth bliss. There is not a taste on the planet that can compare with that experience. Unless it's the peach tree the next day and another moment of amazing bliss. That's kind of what it's like to have homegrown produce in your backyard and to eat it fresh off the tree or the vine or out of the dirt. It's a whole different universe of taste, and it makes the stuff you usually get in the store taste rather bland. So Cherie decided to not only capture that taste experience in her restaurant and keep the family and community connection, but to also keep the seasonal concept as a part of the mix. She uses the phrase, beholden to the seasons. I absolutely love that. In this day and age, it's a really weird thing to try to conceptualize, especially for those of us that live in the city and can get any kind of food at any time you want. You want a kiwi fruit from around the world? That's available at pretty much any time of the year at any store. Plums, pears, oranges? They may taste a little different in February, but you can get them. And that's not necessarily a good thing, always. We kind of lose the rhythm of life, I think, when there's nothing to remind us of the cycles of change. It's the same old thing, over and over. And we kind of get into a rut. But if you eat seasonally with what the earth produces, it's as much an indicator of change as the leaves coming off the trees might be. I might say it's sweater weather. Or I can say it's peach season. I can feel the sun on my face already. What a neat thing to look forward to, and it changes all the time with food production. I hope you take the time to visit Cherie's Farm and Table website. We've added some links at the bottom to ease your way to them. 
Today, we're going to bring you what I understand was a lovely conversation on the patio right before an amazing, edible New Mexico dinner. Rick and Cherie talk about farming, local food, the concept of organic labels versus the practice of sustainable food, and seasonal eating. The community experience, as Cherie explains. And she's big on community. That connection makes sense to me because whether or not we realize it, many of our memories about food are not really about food. They're often about the family, or the friends, or conversations, or the moments, or the celebrations. There is always food involved in the great celebrations of life, but it's usually about those that eat with us. After our podcast, I couldn't resist a little extra. I hope you look up the Farm and Table website and read a few snippets from the ever-changing menus. Seasonal cooking sounds absolutely delicious and definitely not the same old thing. We've read a little bit of it from the dinner menu for you to help you hurry home to your table. Here are Cherie and Rick from Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm Cherie Montoya and this is Farm and Table. We are in Albuquerque, North Valley. And uh, why the name? So we named the restaurant exactly what it was. Um, It is a restaurant, but it's also a working farm. So uh, the restaurant sits on 12 acres and uh, we raise cattle and produce for the restaurant. How did you get involved in this, uh, in this business, in this field? Well, um, it's an interesting story. There was a need here in, in the North Valley. So my family is from this area. We're in north part of Albuquerque, New Mexico on the Rio Grande Valley. And um, there wasn't many restaurants that dealt with local food and supported local farmers. And uh, so this property um, is owned by my family, uh, my father, and I actually started the restaurant as kind of an experiment um, to see if we, if this could be done here in New Mexico, which is a food desert. And um, so uh, I worked with farmers and uh, a lot of, a lot of people who were interested in this project and opened it almost seven years ago. So tell me about some of the types of things that are on your menu. So um, our menu changes all the time. We are beholden to the seasons and here in New Mexico um, it's very particular from month to month, sometimes even week to week. Um, It gets really hot, it gets really cold, it gets windy and that, you know, changes crops pretty quickly. And so our menu is always changing. And um, with that, we do have staples on the menu. We always have kind of a steak dish. We always have a pork dish. Um, But we have the sets that are changing throughout the season. So we raise beef here on site. We also work with um, pueblos and reservations across New Mexico. Um, within the native beef program and so that's where all of our beef comes from and the vegetables just change from season to season so right now we're in October so this is this is harvest season so we have we have the typical items but then we call what I call the crown jewels so the crown jewels are um, items that come into season really they come in quickly and they leave quickly and so right now the things that we're super excited about is quince and we're at the end of pomegranates and people don't realize but they grow really well here in new mexico and we're also harvesting our jerusalem artichokes so those are kind of the special things that we have on the menu right now and all yeah. those you grow here a lot. Of yes, them. we do. And so we grow here on our farm, but we also work with 65 local farmers, ranchers, and food artisans across New Mexico throughout the year. So at any particular time of the year, we work with about 20 of those people um, at a time and 20 of those like organizations. A lot of our farmers are small farmers, some are backyard farmers. So, you know, we're talking with a lot of people throughout the week, throughout the month, and it just, it changes throughout the year. 
So tell me, uh, do you think that your restaurant is about the food experience, or is there a conceptual idea that you're trying to convey, or maybe a little of both? Well, our, our restaurant, I call this place, I really call it a project because it's ever evolving, ever changing. And like I said, we are beholden to the seasons. So when people come out here, yes, there's the end game, you get the food experience. But here, when people come, have the opportunity to come to farm and table, it is a broader experience. So people can come out here and take a walk on the farm. They can see where their food is being grown and raised back here. Um, we also do other things on our farm. We offer yoga and meditation. So it's a full, healthy community experience. And um, we have a lot of reverence to our food and where it's grown and where it comes from and the people that grow it and the people that make it. And I feel that that's conveyed in every single step here at Farm and Table. And so, yes, it is a food experience, but it's a broader experience. I, th I feel like it brings people closer to their food source. And it, I think it conveys love and it just conveys community. And my hope is that people can feel that and experience it when they come here. So it's, it's a little bit different. It's not your typical restaurant. Do you think that all food should be about sustenance and ambience or something more than that? Well, it's definitely, it's definitely more than that. And here in New Mexico, we have deep roots around eating and celebrating, like many cultures do. Um, we have um, here on the Rio Grande Valley, um, where it's very fertile, um, there's a lot of growing. And um, um, like my grandparents grew their food and um, the food that they didn't grow, their neighbors were growing. And so there's this like kind of sharing and celebration and appreciation around food. Yes, it's sustenance and we need it, but when it's, when it's gathered and prepared with love, it's just, it's, you know, it nourishes us in other ways. My mother-in-law used to say, people don't sit down at the table and have the family dinners anymore. And part mm. of that sitting down at the table and having those dinners was mm -hmm. not only to enjoy the meal together, but the conversation, what happened in the day, enjoying, and enjoying that process of eating and discussing uh, uh, current events or whatever you might want to talk about that Absolutely. day. Absolutely. And having that bond of a... Well, I think um, kids right now are kind of um, getting adults back to what is important, back to our roots, because um, I know that kids here in New Mexico are really being educated about um, the farmers markets and local farms. There's a big interest, I think, because it's, um, you know, it's, it can be a hands-on experience. And so I see a lot of kids like telling their parents, hey, let's go to the, the farmers market, and they want to meet their friends there. And so it's like this whole experience around food and meeting the farmers. And these are like kids, like elementary school to high school. Um, my daughter's in high school and, and she meets up with her friends at the farmer's markets, which is so funny to me. But, you know, she's kind of pulling in the adults saying, hey, that's where we want to go on, you know, on Saturday. We want to see, see our friends and see all this food that's being ground, like, it's cool, which is wonderful. And so it's kind of bringing that conversation back to the table. And um, I, I think there's a lot of kids are wanting, they're being encouraged to, you know, to grow at home. So you're kind of seeing almost what you imagine is the reverse. So when people walk out of your door of your restaurant after a meal, uh, what is the impression that you hope that they'll take away with them? Well, I just hope that they had a beautiful experience and that they enjoyed their food and maybe a little more curious about where their food comes from. And maybe, um, you know, some people think that healthy food doesn't taste good. And, you know, it's quite the contrary. So when people come here, the food tastes delicious. And, and maybe some people think, oh, maybe beef isn't healthy for you.
But if it's, you know, beef that's raised the right way, um, no hormones, um, you know, food raised without pesticides and um, herbicides, it's healthy, clean food, it's delicious, and it is good for you. And so hopefully they walk away um, a little more educated, a little more curious, and wanting to create meals like that at home. Do you make an e effort to educate your consumers about the sourcing of your food? And do you think that's important and, and that they should care? Yeah, I mean, we do, we do let people know. I mean, a lot, a lot of our food is so special, so we don't want to give them like this overwhelming spiel. Um, at the same time, we do talk about the things that are local, and we also have it listed on our menu and the source of where it comes from. Not each and every item, but just kind of a, you know, uh, giving people an idea where their food is coming from. We also have it listed on a big chalkboard at the front door. Um, and uh, people have come to kind of know and expect what we're uh, doing. And we also offer a lot of uh, special dinners and we honor farmers. And so there's many opportunities for people who are interested in their food sources to get more involved and hear more about it. I don't know if you use a lot of heritage animals, but how might the idea of using a heritage breed animal in your food sourcing does that appeal to you, you know, with a, cult, a connection of history or culture or anything? Well, I mean, for us, it's more important in the, the, ra the way that they're raised and um, what the animal, how's the animal treated and, and what, it, what it consumes. And so those are our, our, our main concerns when we're looking at our proteins. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot out there and everyone's got something to sell, perhaps. Um, but the things that, and, and the same goes for um, um, organic produce. We don't seek out produce that is certified organic. We work with farmers who grow responsibly, sustainably, and they use no pesticides, herbicides. We visit their farms. We have really good relationships. So we don't require, we don't make any, you know, statements um, uh, about exactly where the food um, the, uh, what the food is and if it's organic. You know, a lot of people will call and they say, do you um, offer organic food? And of course I have to go through the spiel and explain to them our philosophies and principles around how we source our food. Do you think that the menu that, that you feature, it features uh, cultural and historical connections for the grains and veggies and meats that might be appealing to the public? For instance, um, you know, if we were in Arizona, you have the Navajo churro sheep or mm -hmm. something like that, mm -hmm. and the uh, traditional strains of corn or squash. And I know you kind of talked about the history of New Mexico and some of those, but could you go over that a little bit more? Yeah, um, some of our, um, well, we do work with a lot of the, the Pueblos, and we get some of our, our, our corn. All of our corn here is uh, non-GMO, obviously, that we work with. Um, so there's, there's certain things that are... Um, um, that are culturally and historically important. Um, our chili is one of the big things. We're in New Mexico, so this is the chili capital of the world, and that's really important to us. And so we have our green chili and the red chili and um, corn. And we serve, um, we don't serve much corn, but the uh, corn that we do, one of, one of the um, dishes is, is a blue corn atole, which is like a cereal, it's like a, a porridge. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a, an old traditional part of our heritage here in New Mexico. And so, yeah, you, you'll definitely see traditional and cultural um, considerations on the menu. So I'm gonna um, skip around here uh -huh. a little bit and go up and uh, let, let's talk a little bit about the Chef's Collaborative. Okay. So, if you could tell me a little bit about it. Okay, so um, uh, New Mexico historically has not been um, involved in Chef's Collaborative. We are one of the few states in um, the U.S. that doesn't have a local chapter. And so, um, so myself and Stephanie Cameron of Edible um, Santa Fe, the magazine, um, have been well, we know it's important. Um, the Chef's Collaborative is an important resource and opportunity um, to educate 
other um, professionals in in the culinary industry. So uh, restaurant owners, chefs, cooks, um, people in agriculture. And um, it's always been a, um, an important resource for me. And so we recently started up a New Mexico chapter and we're really excited about it because it's an opportunity to tap into these um, national resources and bring them right here to New Mexico. And so that's how we're able to provide this first series of workshop, um, Meat Matters, which is the importance around whole animal utilization, which many chefs and cooks have, you know, they, they know nothing about actually dealing with a live animal and how a live animal becomes the ingredients they use to make the dish. And so this was a really beautiful and wonderful opportunity for us to be able to share um, some resources and education with other cooks and, and chefs. Tell me why you mm -hmm. got involved in it. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I understand you were yep. a little bit you were saying, but uh, let's just say you particularly. Why did you get involved with it? Well, so I'm a community person, so I I like to do things for the greater good. Like this this project is a big community project. My background is actually in nonprofit work, and so um, I realized that when when we have an opportunity to gain information and knowledge and share that knowledge, it raises the bar for what I'm doing here at Farm and Table and what we hope other restaurants to do. So I don't, I want other restaurants to do what I'm doing. I don't want to be the only one. I want to raise the bar, raise the consciousness around it. So Chef's Collaborative is not for me and for the restaurant, but it's for this greater good for this project, for raising um, questions and consciousness and awareness and, you know, being able to educate. When, when that happens, it raises the bar for all of us. And it, it's just, it's beautiful. And that's the way things work. That's the way you really find success is when you can reach out and share. So that's why Chef's, Chef's Collaborative is important for me, yes, and, you know, sending a chef to a conference is great, but bringing it here to New Mexico is a game changer. And again, in the Chef's Collaborative, why is it important to, to work with the local farmers and, and, and you know, that are raising uh, crops or animals and, um, and what this, you know, brings, what kind of message? Well, it's, it's better food. And um, the opportunity for, for um, Farm and Table and other restaurants to work with local farmers, it also stimulates our local economy. You know, New Mexico is kind of a poor state. And for us to find other ways that we can stimulate our economy that does something good for, it's a win-win for everybody. So when there's farmers and ranchers working together and restaurants working together and then the consumers coming in and tasting the food and recognizing how good it is and delicious it is, it's, it's important. It's important for a, for a vibrant community. As Alara promised, here's a sample of the wonderful menu from Farm and Table. Artichoke carts. Lemon, goat cheese, house ciabatta, mojo shrimp, black beans, sweet potato, watermelon radish, cilantro, spiced beets, mushroom, fromage blanc, bacon, arugula, pickled onion, entrees, chicken breast, potato croquette, cabbage, caraway, bacon, gouda, paprika, trout with pea hummus, Quinoa, sunflower sprouts, piperade, radish, duck breast with turnips, buckwheat crepe, mushroom, greens. If you liked our podcast, please subscribe. This is how we keep going. And please tell your friends to join us. Please feel free to post any questions or comments that you might have to our social media sites. Our Twitter feed is at Backyard Green Films, spelled B-K-Y-R-D-G-R-E-E-N-F-I-L-M-S. Our Instagram 
is at Backyard Green Films. B A C K Y A R D G R E E N F I L M S. Our Facebook is Backyard Green Films. Our YouTube URL is youtube.com Backyard Green Films. We want to thank Cherie for taking the time to speak with us today. If you'd like to find out more about Cherie and Farm and Table Restaurant in New Mexico, please visit their website at farmandtablenm.com. And also check out the Chef's Collaborative at chefscollaborative.org. If you find yourself in Albuquerque, New Mexico, we highly recommend you stop by the Farm and Table Restaurant for an amazing meal and experience. You have been listening to Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Please tune in for more upcoming episodes from our travels. I'm Rick Bowman, your behind-the-scenes editor. Until next time. This has been a presentation of Backyard Green Films Productions, all rights reserved, copyright 2020.